All right, everyone. Our, our next speaker is Dr. John Guttag. He is a professor of electrical and computer engineering here at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He uh, is a member of their artificial intelligence group as well. So please uh, join me in welcoming John, John up to the stage. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, I actually thought as soon as people finished lunch, they were going to leave, that you were all just here because you could sit while you ate. But uh, thanks for being here anyway. Um, as was just mentioned, I'm a faculty member at MIT, which means I don't actually do any real work. So uh, the actual work was done by my uh, graduate student, Garthy, who's sitting in the front, and will deliver the more technical version of this uh, presentation tomorrow. So you may have noticed we're, we're in the data-driven medicine group, and maybe that has you scratching your heads and, and wondering what we're doing here. Well, our day job is finding novel ways to predict and or, better yet, avoid adverse medical events. Uh, where that's kind of a code word for dying. Um, <laughs> Consider it a very adverse event in most circles. Um, so we work on choosing cardiovascular therapies, avoiding antibiotic-resistant infections, uh, big project reducing brain damage in premature infants. But we decided we wanted to work on something really important. And so we uh, took a venture into sports and seeing whether we could bring exactly the same techniques, or almost exactly the same techniques we used to analyze vast amounts of medical data to analyzing what may seem like, like a lot of data in the context of sports, but is actually a rather small amount of data in other contexts. So here's the sample question we started with. Um, if the bases are loaded and the game is tied, the count is two and two, should Dustin Pedroia guess what pitch T.C. Sabathia is going to throw? Should he sit on a fastball, for example? Now, an issue of great importance because we expect this to happen in October this year. Um, and we expect Pedroia to swing and miss, but that's a different question. <laughs> uh, so what's our model? Uh, in general, what we're doing is we start with information about past performance uh, for the pitchers, for the hitters, the current state of the game and the at-bat. I'll give you a little more detail about this shortly. And then we solve the binary problem of predicting whether a particular type of pitch will be thrown. Is it, should you guess curveball? Should you guess sinker? What should you guess? Uh, to preview, the result is we can actually do considerably better than simply taking the probability based on priors. By that I mean if somebody throws 88% fastballs, well, if you guess fastball, maybe you'll be right 88% of the time. We can do a lot better than that. What are the factors we consider? And again, a few more details in a bit. Uh, the batter's profile, things like slugging percentage, runs, the kinds of pitches the batter has faced before, um, the game state, uh, the at-bat state, that turns out to be very important. In fact, the count is as important as almost anything in determining the pitch type. And very importantly, the pitcher's prior tendency. What is he likely to throw? And we, we'll call that the prior throughout. And then we couple it with other factors. So in fact, we don't look at the pitcher in general so much as the pitcher versus a particular batter. The method we're using is something called supervised learning. This is, is, is not your grandfather's statistical method. Uh, it's been around for a while in a number of forms. Um, I suspect some of you have credit cards, and maybe you've tried to make a purchase and been told by the merchant, no, you can't. Well, what's happened is the credit card companies all use machine learning to build a model of you based on your past transactions. And then they notice when you're doing something that's inconsistent with that model, suddenly you're buying an automobile in Australia, and they put a hold on it. So that's been around, and we use it a lot in medicine, but it's rarely used, as far as I can tell, in sports analytics. So one of the questions Garthy and I wanted to explore was could we bring this method to bear on, on sports analytics? Here's the basic way it works. You start with 
feature vectors. This is a, a vector, in our case, it'll be of length 49 with different features, uh, the batter, the count, et cetera, and many of them. In fact, we have a feature vector corresponding to every pitch thrown in a whole season. It's a separate feature vector. Um, then we label it, and we label it with the pitch type, fastball, curveball, for example. That goes into a machine learning algorithm. The algorithms we learn, we use are linear support vector machines with soft margins. It's not important. And what is important is what comes out the other end is a pitcher-specific classifier. So this is a, we learn a model of a specific pitcher. We do this on historical data. And then the notion is now you're in a game that's been learned offline. It's sitting on a laptop somewhere or an iPad or a phone. We then take one unlabeled feature vector, that the current game situation, put it into the classifier and get a yes, no answer. Yes, we think it will be a fastball. No, we think it won't be a fastball. We end up building a separate classifier, as I said, for each pitcher and each pitch type. So the 300 pitchers, six pitch types, roughly speaking, 1,800 separate classifiers used to evaluate. The feature vectors are 49 features long. Each feature gets a different weight, and in fact, a different weight for each pitcher. So some pitchers will be more sensitive to the count than others. Some pitchers will be more sensitive to certain batters than others, et cetera. These weights are automatically learned. So we're starting with no a priori assumptions about what's important. We're letting the machine learning mechanism deduce that automatically. And then the features are mapped to this yes, no output. Kind of an awkward title. I apologize for the difficulty in parsing this. Uh, the features get different weights. And what I'm showing you here is the average weights averaged over the 300 pitchers and the six classifiers per pitcher. Um, so you can see that some. Strolled away from the microphone. I should have known better. Is it on? It's on. I'll try not to scream. All right. Um, as I was saying, um, the most important ones are the pitcher batter prior and the pitcher count prior, what the pitcher would do in the count, what the pitcher has done previously against that batter. And these kind of strange things called shrunk priors. Uh, these are in general, all of these are important. You'll notice things that we thought might be important are not here. For example, we expected the stadium to be important, that people would pitch differently in Coors Field, say, than elsewhere. Numbers say they don't. Um, we were surprised at some of those things. So what's this strange stuff about shrunk priors? Is this for Eddie Goodell and small players? Um, no. Um, the problem is, for a lot of pitcher-batter combinations, we don't have enough reliable data. So let's take a look at uh, Tim Wakefield, who pitched for the Red Sox for many years. Um, we all know he mostly throws knuckleballs. I was actually surprised to see he only throws 82% knuckleballs. I would have guessed it was much higher from my personal observations. Uh, I should say these da this data is all from the 2008 season. Um, against Jason Giambi, he throws 90% knuckleballs, and support is the number of pitches. For 59 pitches that year against Jason Giambi, we can believe that. Well, against Adam Everett, he only threw a third knuckleballs, mostly fastballs. But he only threw three pitches. 
to Adam Everett. So if we're guessing what he's going to do next year against Adam Everett, we really don't have a lot of confidence in predictions based upon three pitches. And that gets us to this shrunk priors. And we use the word shrink because what we're doing is shrinking the distance between the prior from this one year where there isn't much data and the overall prior against all the other batters. So in this case, the distance between 82% and 33%. Um, I don't think most of you care about the equation, um, but Garthy made me put it on the slide anyway. Um, so here it is. Um, we take the probability, which is 33%, uh, the support, which is small, the global average, and it's constant, which I think we set to four, um, and run this equation, which gives us another number. We won't worry about the details. And what we see is it changes it dramatically, doesn't reduce it to 12%, but it says, well, maybe only 35%. Uh, that has to do a lot with the constant, but I think you'd all agree that's a better guess than previously. All right, let me talk about the experiments. Uh, Stats Incorporated was very gracious to give us the data we use for this. Uh, we trained on data from 2008, and then we tested on data from 2009. So the two data sets were disjoint. Uh, we looked only at pitchers who threw at least 300 pitches in both years. And then for each, we measured the accuracy, and more interestingly, the improvement over the prior. How much better do we do than just guessing the most prevalent pitch for that pitcher? So let's look at the fastball, because that's the one we have the most data on. The accuracy was 70% across, in this case, 359 pitchers. Uh, our method gave an 18% improvement over the naive model, which is, I think, quite significant. Um, it's better than we ever do in any of our medical work. Uh, the maximum improvement was 311%, and I have to confess, I'm not, it's kind of a cheat. So I, it was for Andy Sonnenstein, and what happened is he learned a new pitch in the offseason. So he didn't have a cutter in 2008. 2009, which if you look at it, was a very good year for Andy Sonnenstein, was because he had a new pitch. And so if you just guess what he used to pit throw, you would be wrong almost all the time. Our model was at least smart enough to do better, even though it had no new data from 2009, uh, and gave us a big improvement. So here's some of the results for the different pitch types. You can see for fastballs, um, the mean accuracy of our model was 68.2%, which was 19.5% better than just guessing the most prevalent pitch for each pitcher. And then it goes down. Uh, here's some examples of individual pitchers, uh, not the extremes. One for whom we got a very large improvement was Kyle McClellan. Um, not surprisingly, since Mario, Mariano Rivera throws so many cutters, if you just guess cutter, you're right most of the time. Um, we only got a 1% improvement, and that was true about most people who threw the same pitch almost all the time. Um, but still, 1% is a fair proportion. And interestingly enough, on Cliff Lee, we got no improvement at all. Um, and I would be embarrassed, except a lot of other people have a hard time guessing what pitch Cliff Lee is going to throw. So I can't feel too guilty about that. Um, being interested in data, we look for a lot of other potentially interesting relationships. Uh, there are a number of them in the paper. Uh, one was interesting to me was predictability against the count. And as you can see here, as the count moves in the batter's favor, the pitchers become more and more predictable. Now, all of you who follow baseball can imagine why that might be. Uh, what was interesting to us is that these differences in these boxes are statistically significant. Uh, P-value is less than 0.05. Um, and between the neutral count uh, and the count, for example, heavily in the batter's favor or one in the pitcher's favor, uh, quite difference in the ability to predict, suggesting, not surprisingly, if you get into this upper region, that's the place you should make a guess, sit on a pitch. 
some future work. Um, I'm sure we can improve the accuracy. Uh, we can do a bunch of technical things. We can use better data, et cetera. Um, we're going to combine this work to get a multi-class classifier, and we're also working on predicting location, which seems pretty easy to predict in some cases. So let's get back to the original question. And uh, I don't suspect Sabathia would like this picture, but he's probably not here either. Uh, or we'll look at the talk so I can do it. But, so what's our question? Here he is on the mound. Pedroia is up. Everything neutral, high probability he's going to throw a fastball. But suppose the bases are loaded and the game is tied it's still most likely he will throw a fastball. Suppose we know the batter is Dustin Pedroia. Still a fastball. And now we know the count is two and two. He's going to throw a sinker, his two-seam fastball. And I show this example because it shows how all of these variables really do matter. And the probabilities change quite significantly as these variables do change. All right, wrapping up, I want to thank Stax for supplying us with the data. Uh, Quanta Computer, they don't know this, but they paid for this work. Please don't tell anybody. Uh, and, uh, and, and we want to thank uh, our colleagues who are pictured here in the, the data-driven medical group, many of whom are, are attending uh, the conference today. And I want to thank all of you for attending. Thank you. And I'll take some questions. If they're really technical, Garthy will have to come up and answer them. Please. Did you, uh, did you think about cutting the data by pitchers' uh, abilities? Did you slice them into skilled pitchers and less skilled pitchers and see how your model worked? So that's an interesting question. One of our hypotheses, and in fact, many of our initial hypotheses turned out to be wrong, was that predictability would correlate with performance, and that the better pitchers would be less predictable. Uh, that does not appear to be true, uh, in part because many of the better pitchers have a dominant pitch, that they are good enough, they don't care, they can win with that pitch. So in fact, there did not seem to be a, a strong correlation between at least measures of ability we used and, and predictability. Uh, it surprised us. I'm sorry, what was it? Correlation between the age of the pitcher and the pitches that might maybe progress to get their needs. Is there a correlation between the age of the pitcher and the pitchers that, pitches that might have changed? I don't know. Age was not one of the features we used. So uh, we could probably look that up and use it, but we did not use age as a feature. We did certainly see that there was a difference in pitchers who would change their pattern from one year to the next. But it's very hard to know what's going on. There are not that many pitchers who do that. Uh, pitchers, are, pitchers who manage to hang around the major leagues manage to be consistent for, for quite a while. Uh, we did see, of course, as we looked at some pitchers near the very tail end of their career, uh, a rather different pitching pattern. Did you take catchers into account at all? Um, and does that show like maybe pitch calling acumen on the part of the catcher? Uh, I think we did not, right? Did we, Gar Garthy? We considered the different, uh, uh, like, uh, they had about uh, eight different configurations. So we considered that, and it turned out to be not so relevant. Yeah, oh. so, well, it wasn't catchers. What Garthy is talking about is we looked at defensive configuration. For example, was there an overshift? Um, where were the po people positioned? Not, not who the people were, but where they were positioned. Turned out that seemed to have no impact on pitch selection, which again surprised me. Yeah. I would have thought that they would be pitching to where the players were positioned. It didn't, the data didn't seem to suggest they actually succeed in doing that. But that was the pitch type. Maybe when we look at location, we'll see something different on that. On the, on the other side of that, how much did hitter performance against specific pitches weigh into your guys' research? Enormous. Okay. Um, the absolute value of the batter's performance didn't matter. We thought, for example, 
you might see different pitch selections to people with high slugging percentages. We didn't see that. But the pitcher batter pair was very, very important. One more thing about the park factors. You guys were talking about how pitchers would pitch certain ways at Coors as opposed to Fenway. Um, did you see a different type of pitch being thrown in different ballparks more than others? No. Uh, it, 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 we, that was not one of the questions we set out to look at, but had that been true, we would have seen the ballpark as an important predictor. It mattered a little bit, but not very much. So there was a slight difference, but it was not important relative to some of these other features. You mentioned that you account for like the time or point in the game for pitch selection, but do you account for like say if uh, CeCe Sabathia is facing Pedroia in the bottom of the seventh if he had already faced him in the third or second inning? Yes, that was one of the interesting things that Garthy looked at that I, I had not thought to look at was how things changed over time. And what's interesting there is yes, it changes the inning, the, how many times you face the batter, but the other interesting thing is score differentials, if they're big in the beginning of the game, have an impact that's different from if they're big near the end of the game. So the score differential also has a significant impact, especially in the beginning of the game, on pitcher predictivity. The end of the game is complicated because those are typically relief pitchers and, and things are a bit different than they are with, with starters. Does pitch location have anything to do with the equation? Well, it has a lot to do with it. And, and in fact, uh, another group of my students, uh, many of whom are here, uh, have been working on studying pitch location and uh, the impact of various things and have had some surprising results, at least surprising to me. I had always assumed, and it's probably because I've watched and listened to too many baseball games, that, for example, that climbing the ladder was an effective way to get a batter to chase a pitch. There's no indication that that's true in the data. It's a great thing for an announcer to talk about, but it seems totally irrelevant. And, and, and a number of other things are, are pretty interesting. So there's another group of students who have been working on, on location. And in Garthy's work, he, location was a feature. And in particular, the location of the previous pitch was relevant, as was, of course, the type of the previous pitch. Yes? Did you look at, did you look at the team, the on-deck hitters, the quality of the on-deck hitter in terms of what that does to pitch selection? No, we, we did not look at the on-deck hitter, and uh, that's a brilliant suggestion by a brilliant young man who, who, who happens to be my son, so. <laughs> I'm trying to stump him. Yeah, he, he, thought, he, he said he'd stump me, and he did, but I, all right, thank you, Michael. You're welcome. <laughs> I'll tell your mother. <laughs> uh, if nothing else, the. As usual, Michael has the last word. Thank you. <laughs>